Prior to the break, we studied the remarkable complexities of the movements of the shoulder girdle. With such complex movements, it shouldn't be surprising that an equally complex arrangement of muscles produce these motions. This is the topic of today's second session. Welcome back. Now that we have a framework of the shoulder girdle in place, it's time to consider the muscles that are found in this region and consider their actions. For this second session, we'll be discussing origins, insertions, and neurovascular support of these muscles. We'll also identify some of the anatomical spaces made up of muscular boundaries and how these spaces can be used to localize important neurovascular structures. We'll finish off with a brief look at the breast found in the pectoral region in close approximation to the shoulder and look at a couple more clinical conditions. Now that we have the bony framework in place, time to lay down the musculature. The pectoralis major is the most prominent muscle in the region. It consists of two heads. The clavicular head originates off the antero-inferior shaft of the clavicle. The sternal head originates off the manubrium and body of the sternum and costal cartilages 1 through 6. The fibers converge on a narrow insertion point along the lateral ridge of the intertubercular groove. Based on the fiber orientation, the muscle serves to horizontally flex the shoulder joint, as seen in the bench press exercise. It also is an adductor and medial rotator of the shoulder. It is innervated by both the medial and lateral pectoral nerve of the brachial plexus and receives its vascular supply through the pectoral branch of the thoracocromial trunk. Though it shares part of its name with the major, the pectoralis major is much smaller with a very different functional role. It originates off the coracoid process, inserting on ribs 3 through 5. It's thought to play a role in stabilizing the scapula to facilitate movements at the shoulder joint, as well as elevate the ribs during active breathing. It also receives its blood supply from the pectoral branch of the thoracocromial trunk, but unlike the pectoralis major, it is innervated by the medial pectoral nerve exclusively. Subclavius is an often overlooked muscle. As the name implies, it is found inferior to the clavicle, running at an oblique angle to attach the shaft of the clavicle to the first rib. It serves to slightly depress the clavicle, but is thought to play a greater role in stabilizing the scapula through isometric contraction. Probably the easiest innervation you will ever have to learn, as the nerve branch is so small it is actually called the nerve to subclavius. Just deep to the pectoralis major muscle is a broad fascial boundary which projects off the clavicle, envelops the pectoralis minor, and projects inferiorly to separate the superficial structures of the pectoral region from the deep axillary space. This broad expanse of loose areolar connective tissue, known as the clavipectoral fascia, is subdivided into distinct regions. The subclavius fascia projects from the inferior surface of the clavicle and subclavius muscle. Here it thickens into the ligamentous costal coracoid ligament, which interconnects these two bony structures. Moving inferiorly, the fascia once again thins and is known simply as the costal coracoid membrane. Upon encountering the superior border of pectoralis minor, the fascia splits to envelop the muscle, where it is now referred to as the pectoralis minor fascia. It continues to project from the inferior border of the pectoralis minor muscle as the suspensory ligament of the clavipectoral fascia. This fuses with the pectoralis fascia projecting from the pectoralis major muscle to form the axillary fascia, which forms the floor of the axilla. The clavipectoral fascia helps to compartmentalize the deep axillary space and provides a natural fascial plane to assist with the gliding of superficial and deep muscles relative to each other. A number of neurovascular structures we will be discussing pierce the clavipectoral fascia. In contrast to the thoracohumeral muscles originating off the trunk, the scapulohumeral muscles originate directly off the scapula itself. Four of these muscles converge onto either the greater or lesser tubercles of the humerus and are known as the rotator cuff muscles. As its name implies, supraspinatus originates off the supraspinous fossa. The tendon runs deep to the acromion process to the subacromial tunnel to insert on the greater tubercle of the humerus. Because of its superior course, the glenohumeral joint, the supraspinatus is actually an abductor of the shoulder, rather than a rotator. 
Inferior to the spine of the scapula is the infraspinous muscle. This muscle also inserts on the glenoid tubercle, but because it passes posterior to the joint capsule, it is considered a true external rotator of the shoulder. The third muscle off the rotator cuff is teres minor. It's a small rounded muscle, note that the term teres is Latin for round, which blends in quite discreetly with the infraspinatus muscle and also serves as a lateral rotator of the shoulder. The last of a rotator cuff group, subscapularis, originates off the anterior surface of the scapula, crossing anterior to the glenohumeral joint to insert on the lesser tubercle of the humerus. Because of this anterior course, the subscapularis is a medial rotator of the shoulder. Although not technically part of the rotator cuff, the teres major is also discussed here as one of the scapulohumeral muscles. It's the larger round muscle which originates off the inferior angle of the scapula and inserts on the medial ridge of the intertubercular groove, just inferior to latissimus dorsi. As it passes antero-inferior to the shoulder, it is considered an adductor and lateral rotator of the shoulder joint. Note that antagonistic actions of the infraspinatus and teres minor to subscapularis and teres major. The one group contracts to laterally rotate the shoulder, the other group medially rotates. The rotator cuff muscles serve another important function discussed earlier. Previously, we mentioned the lack of stability and ligamentous support at the shoulder to facilitate movement. These medial and lateral rotators we just discussed contribute to that stability through active support. Imagine for a second that my chest is the glenoid fossa and that this ball is the head of the humerus. My right arm would represent the lateral rotators, for example, while my left arm would represent the medial rotators. So I pull back on my right hand the ball spins in one direction. I pull back on my left hand, the ball spins in the other direction, just like we showed in the previous slide. But if I pull on both hands together, I pull the ball in tight to my chest. Similarly, any time we push off of something, for example, we subconsciously activate both our lateral and medial rotators so that our scapula can hold on to the head of the humerus. Many dislocations result from posterior blows, such as when a blindside linebacker sacks a quarterback, and in a lot of these instances, the patient never saw the hit coming, and therefore was never able to brace for impact. This image provides a lateral view of the scapulohumeral muscles, demonstrating their relationship to one another. Note that three of the four muscles insert on the greater tubercle of the humerus, from superior to inferior, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. Subscapularis, on the other hand, inserts on the lesser tubercle. You can easily demonstrate this relationship using the index, middle, and ring fingers of your hand to represent supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor, respectively, inserting posteriorly, and your thumb to represent teres major, inserting anteriorly. The mnemonic SITS is often used to describe this insertion pattern in these four muscles. Also note the path of the supraspinatus muscle under the acromion process, through the so-called subacromial tunnel. The rotator cuff musculature is readily visible under MRI imaging. A coronal image allows for a view of the supraspinatus muscle and tendon as it courses under the acromion process to insert on the head of the humerus. An axial view through the shoulder gives us an image of the infraspinatus and subscapularis muscles attaching to the greater and lesser tubercles of the humerus. Again, this coronal section allows for an appreciation of the relationship between the supraspinatus tendon and the acromion process. This close approximation creates difficulty with friction between the two structures during abduction and adduction movements. This is partially reduced through the presence of a series of bursal sacs found in and around the tendons of the shoulder muscles. Bursa are formed from the same synovial membrane that line the synovial joints. Some of these, as we saw with the subscapular bursa, are actually a continuation of the synovial membrane itself. And much like synovial joints, they also contain synovial fluid. Bursal sacs can be thought of as very small water balloons. If I take my two hands and start rubbing them together like this, it doesn't take long for the skin to become warm and irritated. Now consider if this was a tendon of the supraspinatus rubbing against the underside of the acromion process. You can probably see how, over a period of time, you would wear through the tendon like a frayed piece of rope. With the water balloon between my hands, however, the surfaces roll with that of my hands, and the friction is dissipated through the water molecules. The bursa provides the same effect for the tendons around the shoulder joint, reducing the friction with the bony projections.
Now, although they help, the bursa do not eliminate friction entirely, and the supraspinatus also has a tendency to become impinged, particularly with forceful overhead motions. The subacromial bursa can also be inflamed and swollen, contributing to the problem. This results in tendinitis and pain, and can ultimately result in rupture of the supraspinatus tendon. Tearing can also occur acutely during a fall on an outstretched hand. This is the classical rotator cuff tear. Although other muscles of the rotator cuff can be torn, the supraspinatus is by far the most commonly affected. The final scapulohumeral muscle to discuss is the deltoid muscle. Named for its resemblance to the triangular letter of the Greek alphabet, it's a broad, thick muscle that provides the shoulder with its rounded appearance. It has an extensive origin that mirrors the insertion of trapezius from the spine of the scapula over the acromion and lateral third of the clavicle. These fibers then converge on the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. It is supplied by multiple arterial branches and innervated by the axillary nerve. It's also similar to trapezius in having multiple functions depending on the specific fibers being contracted. Activation of the middle fibers shown in green, or maximal activation of the whole muscle, initiates abduction at the shoulder. The anterior fibers shown in red cross in front of the joint and initiate shoulder flexion. Those fibers shown in blue line posterior to the joint and generate the opposite movement of shoulder extension. The muscles that we have been looking at, as well as additional muscles we will discuss in later lectures, help to define the boundaries for three separate spaces for communication between the pectoral and scapular regions of the shoulder, and neurovascular structures pass from anterior to posterior in these regions. The triangular space is made up of three boundaries, the teres minor and major superiorly and inferiorly, and the triceps laterally. The quadrangular space is defined by the borders of the teres muscle, minor superiorly and major inferiorly once again, the long head of the triceps medially, and the humerus laterally. Finally, we have the triangular interval, which is distinct and not to be confused with the triangular space. It's formed by the border of the teres major superiorly and the long and lateral head of the triceps muscle medially and laterally. Identification of these spaces allows us to landmark a number of neurovascular structures that pass within them. The suprascapular artery and nerve both pass over the superior margin of the scapula to supply supraspinatus. They then course inferiorly around the spine of the scapula to also supply the infraspinatus muscle. Note the arrangement of the artery passing superior and the nerve passing inferior to the transverse scapular ligament. The expression army over navy is often used as a reminder of this arrangement for the artery and nerve. Identification of the quadrangular space allows us to pinpoint the axillary nerve and posterior humeral circumflex artery, which access the posterior scapular portion of the shoulder through this space. After supplying branches to the teres minor, the neurovascular bundle continues on to supply the deltoid muscle. Note once again the triangular space, opened further in this view with excision of the teres minor. This space accommodates the passage of the scapular circumflex artery, which supplies blood to the inferior portion of the infraspinous fossa. We'll be able to trace its origins in the next lecture. Finally, we can once again take note of the triangular interval, which allows for passage of the radial nerve and profunda brachia artery, which will be discussed in a later lesson. We finish today with a discussion of the mammary gland, associated with the pectoral region. It's composed of a mixture of glandular tissue arranged in lobules and adipose tissue supported by suspensory or Cooper's ligaments. It's the stretching of the suspensory ligaments over time due to gravitational pull that is responsible for the sagging of breasts with advanced age. Like most mammalian species, the lactiferous glands produce milk for offspring following childbirth. Each lobule drains milk into one of numerous lactiferous ductules that continue to collect together to form anywhere from 4 to 18 separate terminal ducts, which drain directly into the nipple. Just prior to their termination, each duct expands into a sinus for the collection of milk just under the nipple. Compression of these sinuses during suckling or manual compression releases milk from the nipple and generates a negative pressure to express more milk from the lactiferous glands. A blockage in any portion of the ductile network can lead to infection and inflammation, a condition known as mastitis. 
Breast tissue is relatively mobile as a result of anatomical plane called the retromammillary space that allows the breast to glide smoothly over the fascia of the pectoralis major muscle lying underneath. For the purpose of anatomical description, the breast can be divided into four separate quadrants, superior and inferior, medial and lateral quadrants. Note that the superior lateral quadrant contains extension known as the axillary process due to the direction that it projects. Breast cancer is the most common form of invasive cancer in the female population, resulting in a half million annual deaths worldwide. This most commonly affects the glandular cells within the lobules or epithelial lining of the ductile system, which may ultimately metastasize to other areas of the body. Early detection is pivotal to survival, as early stage tumors can be removed before metastasis can occur. Early tumors present as hard masses within the mammillary gland that is noticeable with palpation. Educating patients, particularly over the age of 40, or conducting proper self-examinations is a simple, cost-effective means of detecting many of these cancers early on. It's important to recognize that tumors may occur in areas far removed from what we traditionally consider the breast, such as the axillary process. Other signs are associated with more advanced cases of breast cancer. More pronounced tumors may result in irregularities in overall contour of the breast on visual inspection. If a tumor metastasizes to the lymphatic system, compromised lymphatic drainage may result in a characteristic swelling called lymphedema just under the skin, resulting in a levery dimpled patch appearance to the skin known as the pie d'orange, or orange peel sign. Tumors may also result in fibrosis of the glandular tissue, resulting in retraction of the suspensory ligaments and dimpling of the skin around the area of the tumor. In highly advanced stages, the tumor may cross the retromammillary space to invade the underlying pectoralis fascia. This results in adhesions between the normally mobile breast and the underlying pectoralis fascia. The breast is therefore less mobile and does not elevate as is normally seen during shoulder abduction. The mammillary tissue may also appear to move abnormally with contraction of the pectoralis major muscle. In these advanced stages, prognosis is unfortunately very poor. That concludes our lesson on the shoulder region. Having identified the boundaries of the axilla, we'll be looking more closely at the axillary contents in the next session. This includes an even greater review of lymphatic drainage of the breast, as well as the dreaded brachial plexus. Until that happy time, this has been Dr. Stuart Engels. Enjoy the rest of your day. 